there is a, uh, a video, a BBC video. You can't really see the image here, but it's a very long corridor full of boxes of uh, paper records of clinical trials carried out, I believe, by Glaxo Smith Klein. And um, most of these trials uh, never saw the light of day in any form. So the, the fact that the trials were taking place presumably is known, but the results of the trials uh, were never published. And there is a quite uh, powerful movement in the UK, in Europe, and in the NIH circles here to bring about a situation where all federally funded or all publicly funded clinical trials are uh, mandated to publish their results. Now, I believe that we are on the way to bringing about a uh, realization of that mandate. It's, um, it's very incremental, um, but it's happening. And uh, it's a good thing that it happened uh, because of all the obvious reasons. Uh, negative results of clinical trials may not be interesting to a drug company, they may be interesting to everyone else. Now, um, so the White House has supported this public access policy. And um, of course, part of the public access policy will involve digitalization. And increasingly data like this, the long corridor of boxes, will be digitalized. The publication of the results does not by any means imply the publication of all of this digital data. I believe that within our lifetime, uh, all of this digital data, all of this paper data will indeed be digitalized. Google has managed to digitalize virtually all of the print resources of mankind within a relatively short space of time. The, the technology to turn all of this data into digital data is, practically speaking, already there. Uh, the, uh, the question is whether it would be worthwhile to digitalize all of this data. And I believe, and I will give some uh, reasons for believing, that it is worthwhile to publish, uh, sorry, to, to digitalize all of this data. Now we have a, a further question. Is it worthwhile to publish all this digitalized data. And the, my thesis today is that all of this data will be digitalized and ought to be made public, freely available for anybody to use. Um, now, of course, if that's going to be worthwhile, then we have to have ways in which we can use the data. And that's the real problem. The justification for publishing this data depends upon the data being published having some utility. And uh, currently, most of it would have no utility because no one would understand it. Because most of it has been created by uh, clinical trialists who had no interest in making their data publicly accessible and so basically, when they were collecting their data, they used secret codes, old codes, codes the meaning of which only dead people know about, which means that the effort involved in making the digital content of all of this data useful would be basically infinite. It would not be worthwhile publishing all of this data to the degree to which it has zero benefit to anybody who might want to study it. And so I, I introduce here the word prospectively. Gradually, people are beginning to be aware that they need to collect data without using secret codes. So the FDA is mandating the use of CDISC standards which are basically standard for coding clinical trial data, the meanings associated with which are going to be known to people because the CDISC standards are going to be published. Some of them already are published and some of them are already being used. 
the idea is that gradually more and more of the data like this, more and more of the data which drug companies are going to be collecting is going to be such that we can access it and use it, at least in the sense that we will not be wasting our try time trying to guess the meaning of secret codes. So paper is giving way to digitalized data and more and more studies are coming online within the relevant uh, local communities. Uh, but as more and more digitalized data becomes available for people to use, for instance, people in Buffalo can use the clinical trial data of their colleagues in Buffalo, the more and more it will be necessary to go beyond the situation where we have local codes, because CDISC only covers certain aspects of a clinical trial structure, and the more it will be necessary to have global codes or global descriptions of data which, which everyone can understand. So what we need is something like CDIS, but we need CDIS for every single clinical discipline. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Now, there is one piece of philosophy in this talk. Uh, philosophers like to assert that ought implies can. So in other words, if you ought to make clinical data public, then it must be possible to make clinical data public. And if you ought to make clinical data public in a useful way, then it ought to be possible to make clinical data public in a useful way. So it, can we make clinical data public in a useful way? Well, with the, that, is, that is what the import project is all about. Import is making clinical data public in a useful way. We're doing it already. And public means global, not just for the people in Buffalo who happen to be work, working with the PI of a, of a clinical trial. Anyone in, in the world can use clinical trial data, which is being made available on the import website. So you have to apply for a password, but you will be granted a password, roughly speaking, on the basis of your email address. If you have an EDU email address, you will get a password. Import already has 89 complete data sets from 89 trials, and there are hundreds more in the pipeline. These data are de-identified, so we couldn't make the data available for use unless we had de-identification. That's quite an expensive process. And um, the, the, there are a wide range of different kinds of trials, but they're all basically trials relevant to human immunology. So they are vaccine uh, tolerance, they are transplant medicine, uh, allergy, and so forth. Basically, they are trials funded by NIAID and specifically by the division of NIAID, which is called DATE, which is the division which studies human immunology on the host side. So we, this is not pathogen-related data, although we will mention pathogen-related data later on. And of course, you can't study human influenza response without at least paying some attention to the pathogen. There is a large multi-site um, NIH-funded consortium called HIPSI, which has 22 studies within import. And this is uh, a very, very um, uh, advanced technology-based clinical trials using mass cytometry amongst other technologies. And most of our work so far has been uh, developing ontologies to support the work of the HIPSI uh, consortium. So these are the, the main consortia in addition to HIPSI for which we are uh, responsible for publishing the clinical trial data. So the immune tolerance network is very important, and I'll talk about that later on. And then there are um, organ transplantation uh, in children uh, and so on. We're also uh, negotiating with the Gates Foundation, who see import as being a very 
important step in what they see as being the right direction when it comes to managing clinical trial data. And it, the, basically the idea is that not just date-funded trials will put their data in import, but all human immunology research will use import as the home for its data. So it, it, this is quite an ambitious project. Uh, the de-identification and the management of the project uh, and roughly speaking, over five years, it's anticipated that this will be a $30 million project. We're now in year two of the second iteration. There was a first iteration of five years during which the infrastructure was built. Uh, we're now in year two of the second iteration. Um, the PI is at Stanford University, that's Atul Butte. And UB is responsible for the ontology work, which is what I'll be talking about mainly today. And, and Alex, Alex, and Alan, Alan, wave your hand, are in the room, together with various people who are working with Alex and Alan on some of these uh, projects. And then we have uh, partners, including the, the, the Tel Aviv. Now, the... Um, the, it, I, to me, it's obvious why we want the data to be free, uh, but it's good to list some of the ideas which are being worked on concretely in the import context. So the one idea is that this will help education. So eventually we're going to have very large numbers of pathology images, for instance, all of which will be in effect annotated with clinical data. And one um, idea that we will be pursuing is that this huge resource of pathology image data could be useful for teaching pathologists to recognize specific kinds of phenomena. Another use, uh, is, which again is already being practically realized, is replication of results. So we want to rerun trials. Certainly we want to rerun the digital aspect of trials in order to double check that no mistakes were made. And the more people who look at the data in import, the more we have the opportunity that they will indeed find it interesting enough to rerun the trials because they will see something wrong with the trial. It will not cohere with what they think uh, ought to be the case. And this goes hand in hand, of course, with scientific scrutiny. So not all clinical trials were uh, executed uh, with the maxi maximal degree of care and responsibility or economy. But the main reason, I believe, is secondary use. So using clinical trial data in order to, in effect, run new trials, but with no new necessary medical intervention. Because we already have so much data, if we use the right kinds of approaches, we ought to be able to create new knowledge from these data uh, without the necessity to run new trials and so without the necessity to have new IRB processes and so on and so forth. Some of this will be done commercially. So one, that there are again already practical realizations in the direction of creating new companies to exploit the import data, which is something that the AID uh, uh, and many people in Stanford University particularly strongly support. Um, these new companies are doing things that anyone can do. They are, for instance, associating existing clinical trial data with new knowledge about molecular biology, which did not exist when the original trials were run. Uh, we can reanalyze original results by linking them to omics data, which is coming on stream, but also, and I'm going to talk uh, at some length about this, we can reanalyze results of old trials by combining them to do meta-trials. So we talked about education. This is, uh, this is still preliminary. This is a, a, a project which is being pursued in Stanford. Uh, so there are four pediatric transplantation studies of specific drugs to be given to children. And um, they're all, roughly speaking, about the same kind of drug. Uh, they were carried out at overlapping times. 
And they were carried out using uh, not quite the same interval for follow-up. So here you can see the intervals for follow-up. I, I, I don't want to go into uh, any great detail here. Uh, all I can tell you is that the results of this meta trial were astonishing seem to be astonishingly different from the results claimed by the people who could uh, market certain drugs. So once you compared the four, you got quite different results from what seems to be the results of each trial individually. What we're interested in, just for purposes of illustration, is just the follow-up time points for the four studies. These are the follow-up time points. And in order to do a meta trial, you need to find data which is comparable. So you need to line up uh, points, uh, visit points for the patients in such a way that all four of the trials have data for those visit points. Now that should have been trivial. It was not trivial. And it was not trivial for the following reason. So I said I would talk about the immune, immune tolerance network, which is a gigantic network of trialists in immuno, immunology. Ravi Shankar is the oncologist we work with in Stanford, who is working on a C-disc oncology. Ravi Shankar analyzed the way in which the immune tolerance network treats visit times, visit days. And this is a, a picture of the various different I won't say silos, I will say provinces of data within the ITN data model. So we have the flow cytometry data, which is yellow, the HLA, HLA data, which is purple, and so on. And we have a protocol uh, data, protocol data, assay data, and so on. Now, the ITN community uses different names for visit days. Sometimes they call them zero or one. Uh, so this is true of the protocol group and the assay group. Uh, sometimes they call them day zero, comma, transplant, which is true of the CRO group. Sometimes they call them B space zero. <laughs> sometimes they call them B zero, comma, visit space zero. Sometimes they call them V0 without a space, sometimes with a space. Um, so just from one organization which has one common data model, we have at least six different ways of referring to visit days. And so aligning visit days across four studies turns out to be a difficult job. Now, this problem has been recognized. There are people who are working hard to standardize the ways in which visit days are represented. But this is just one tiny fraction of all of the different dimensions within a given set of clinical trial data, which causes problems for doing meta trials. This is just for numbers. Uh, imagine what will happen when we start thinking about words for things like B cells which some people call B cells with a space, some people call B cells without a space, some people call big B, little c, and so on and so on. Now, mappings between the various different arrays within the ITN data model are missing. So they had to be built by hand just for the visit days. This is just for one meta trial. So, how are the problems of creating meta trials, which are just a, a, an illustration of general problems created for all secondary use of clinical trial data, being solved? The answer is they're being solved by hard work on the part of human beings, most of them working for or with a tool in Stanford. So they spend days trying to line up visit days. They, they spend, the, 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 the meta trial I was describing was started some months ago. They still are not at the point of completion because there are still issues about lining up different kinds of data. This means that if we're dealing with hundreds of trials, thousands of trials, and we want to harvest the data in these thousands of trials, the 
strategy that we have available to us at the moment, which is weeks and weeks of very expensive Stanford postdoc time, is not going to scale. So this is not the right way to solve the problem. Moreover, this is not what the NIAID wants. They don't want to make this, tra this, this data available in order that cherry picking can take place through incredibly difficult amounts of effort on behalf of small groups who are being funded by the NIAID to do this work anyway. They want the data to be used by um, ambitious teenagers in India or Brazil or somewhere who are going to find new uh, gems of data by, um, by using tools which they can get off the shelf, not by spending weeks and weeks and making phone calls to the original PIs to find out what particular code means. So the, um, the NIAID wants import to accelerate the creation of a coordinated research environment. They want an integrated database. They don't, don't just want a pot of data which is formatted and formulated in hundreds of different kinds of incompatible ways. And they want to create standards which will be such that they will accelerate the speed of doing clinical trials in the future because people will be able to reuse these standards and reuse the existing data. So they can, they can see already when they start whether particular aspects of what they plan to do a trial on have already been uh, the subject of clinical trials carried out earlier. So they want to promote the rapid availability of important findings, not just create uh, a, an ocean in which people can uh, swim, uh, trying to spot things that might be interesting. So, how can we change the situation so that the kind of work that we need to do can be done not by hard, dedicated, week-long effort on behalf of a very uh, uh, people with very specialized knowledge, but in such a way that the work can be done more or less automatically? Well, we have a pipeline. We have the yellow parts, which are um, the parts carried out by the hospitals or by the contract research organizations who are carrying out the trial. <coughs> then we have the blue part, which is being carried out by Northrop Grumman, which is to process the data which they receive from the data providers. And then finally, we have the green part, which is when the data is actually being used. So the, the PIs, the hospitals, the biostatisticians send data to Northrop Grumman, and then the, there is a technical term, which is the max and the mean lead. But basically, these are the people, uh, the specialist bioinformaticians, uh, primarily still people working in Stanford, who have to try and use the data provided to North, Northrop Grumman and de-identified by Northrop Grumman. So where do, where, do, where do we do what is necessary to minimize or at least reduce the need for hard work? <coughs> there are different views on this uh, subject. Um, so the problem here is that we have lots of free text, lots of local formats, local standards, local terminologies. In a way, the more advanced the science, the more likely it is that we're dealing with local terminologies that other people don't understand. CDIS is always out of date because it takes years to get the new standard approved um, within the CDIS community. Many of these trials have nothing to do with CDIS officially in any case because CDIS is for FDA funded trials. People who are doing trials which are not uh, drug trials probably have no use to see this. So, one strategy uh, is what we call post coordination. We work with Northrop Grumman and we work with Stanford to create uniform standards and ontology. We take whatever 
data, I was going to say junk, but I will say data, we get from the trialists, and then we impose the ontologies, the standards, uh, post hoc. Any solution is going to involve some post coordination. But you see the problem with post coordination. Post coordination means hard work. You have to line up all the V zeros. Post coordination presupposes that we have different kinds of data coming from different sources. And if we're going to make that data accessible by using standards and ontologies, we have the only way to do that is hard work. I have nothing against hard work, but hard work does not scale. So my idea is pre-coordinate. Um, so I, I am a megalomaniac. I am more ambitious than anybody. I think we can teach people working in hospitals to use common standards and common terminology. And that's what we're going to try to do. We've already started doing it. So working with the people here, we create standards. And then we encourage the people here to use those standards. And the idea is that they will all use the same standards and they will use standards that actually work well when, when it comes to doing metatrials, when it comes to associating data with bio, from the clinic with bioinformatics <coughs> data, for instance. The FDA is trying to, uh, the FDA is also a megalomaniac, but they have more power than I have. The FDA is trying to do the same thing with CDIS. I'll come back to see this later, but basically there are three alternative approaches. Post-coordination, which is, will not scale. Pre-coordination, FDA variety, which is going to happen. But CDISC is not necessarily a good tool to solve our problem. And then pre-coordination in a way which I'm going to describe uh, in a bit more detail here. So first of all, we have to remember that the people who get funding from the NIAID to do human immunology trials have to submit their data to import already. That they don't get the money unless they do this. And they are amazingly doing it. And Northrop Grumman works with them uh, quite extensively to help them to do it. They create data templates. The data templates need to be populated. This is an extra step. It's quite costly, but they do it. Um, they also have to do it if they work with the FDA. We've already seen that. They have to do it to some degree when they publish their results. So the NIA mandates a data sharing plan. And the data gets tagged also when people start using it. So after the trial is completed, there's further tagging. But all of this tagging is just uncoordinated. There's no guidance. It's local tagging to a large degree. And therefore, you can't use it effectively in order to harvest new information. So if ought implies can, and if clinical data ought to be made freely available in de-identified form, then we have to be able to make clinical data available in the identified form. We will be able to support doing this only if we can show that this brings use, utility, value, but it will only bring value of a sort which can scale if we can have some kind of standardization and replace the existing local uncoordinated tagging with a much more systematic and uh, um, useful kind of tagging of the sort which um, we're supposed to create. This is what the ontology team to import is supposed to create. And as I say, there are two ways of doing this. One way is via what we like to think of as being consensus-based ontologies, and the other is procedures. So let's talk a bit about the first strategy. So if we can persuade the people running the trial not just to, to uh, send their data to import 
following the import templates, but to actually collect it from the very start, following templates which are created in such a way that they are based on coherent ontology. And because the data doesn't have to go through extra steps of analysis, except the identification by Northrop Grumman, because the data is as it was originally collected, it means that the data is, is of higher quality than if it's data which has been tailored for a specific kind of template purpose. So the idea is that the data at the very start will be collected in the way in which it gets through to the analysts on the other side, the maxims and the minimum. It also means that because these ontologies are all published and they're well known to people, and many of the ones that we recommend to you are well known to people, people will be able to discover that data much more easily. So if you have an idea for a clinical trial and you want to, on B cell memory, for instance, B cell memory regulate, you want to know if there are any trials on B cell memory regulation, then it would be good if the trials were annotated using a standard term for B cell memory regulation, which you can which you already use. It, it also means that the submission of data is not an extra cost. The data can just be sent to import as it is because you've been using the right templates from the start. Um, now this, this works whether you're working for the FDA or not. It's going to be useful even if you are working for the FDA because CDIS will likely not cover your discipline-specific terminology anyway. Um, and it works even if you can only do it for part of the data that you have. So you don't have to do this for the whole of your data. Even part of the data will bring all the benefits. And then once you've shown those benefits, you can go back to your boss and get money to implement new ontology. And because the ontologies are built to work with bioinformatics resources, you get immediate integration with bioinformatics data which means that your trial will potentially be more powerful, and certainly it will be more powerful for analysts who are working with your trial data later. So these are some of the ontologies that we are uh, working with. Uh, the gene ontology and the cell ontology are pretty well known. Uh, we are going to be creating an antibody ontology. We already have an in in import antibody registry, which I'll mention in a minute, and so on. One interesting thing is that even though we're doing this work for the host side data, exactly the same ontologies will also be useful to, and are in fact to some degree already being used by, the people who work for the NIAID on the pathogen side. So the people who work with virus and, ba and bacteria data. So the, the import antibody registry we are creating because immunologists are anarchists when it comes to the terminology they use to describe things like antibodies and targets for antibodies. And the only way in which we're going to make the data which they are submitting to import useful is to line up on specific ways of describing things like B-cells. Um, so this is a fragment from the antibody registry. Uh, the idea is that we have various markers here, and there are various alternative names. So CD2 has an alternative name, sheep red blood cell receptor. Now, if you have a, a, a the data about sheep red blood cell re receptor, you may not know that that is CD2. And the idea is that the the antibody ontology which we will build will enable data about CD2 to be findable by you immediately, even if it's labeled using something to do with sheep. And this means that you can, this will mean that you can carry out all kinds of queries in order to discover information, even if it's not described in the way that you would want it to be described. All right, so that's the first strategy. We're, we're, we're doing this strategy, we're working with people in large contract research organizations to find the ideal way in which they can describe their data so that they can submit their data to import without any extra step. And they like the ideas that we're proposing, but we're dealing with large organizations who are, have uh, the, all the characteristic features of large organizations, 
Uh, and so it, this has to be a, a multi threaded endeavor, including education, dissemination, propaganda, humiliation, uh, and, and threat. Only some of which I have at my disposal. Um, all right, so then the other strategy, and we're going to have to work with this strategy too. We, we can't just ignore the FDA. Um, I promised myself I would not say bad things about the FDA, so I'm not going to say bad things about the FDA. Um, so, even if you're not working on drug trials, even if you're not getting funding for the FDA, the force of CDIS is growing and growing, which means that it's, I'm sad to say this, but it's almost certainly going to be the case that everyone will have to use CDIS anyway. CDIS is an old Thing. Um, it does not necessarily conform to the way in which we would build a coding system for clinical trial data today. If, if everybody used CDISC and if CDISC covered everything, which it doesn't, then you could just create mappings between CDISC and ontology. And then you could get all the benefits of the ontology, again, through some automatic step. And so CDISC, a, a universal CDISC regime would not necessarily be the end of the world. Um, unfortunately, CDISC was, what well, CDISC is taking a long time to implement. I, I think it's 14 years and they still have only just got sort of a, a, an agreement, sort of. Um, and CDISC is still very partial. And CDISC is, is primarily devoted to the needs of the data managers. Who need to who need to code case report forms? It's not devoted to the needs of people doing clinical research, and it's not devoted to the needs of people doing analysis of data for secondary purposes. So the way I would describe it is that if you have a good ontology, it composes well. You can put together data from different sources and get composed data, the meaning of which you can understand. CDISC is a long list of secret codes, most of them ugly. No one would ever remember what they mean. Sorry, I'm saying bad things. Um, another problem, and I, here I'm speculating, but everyone I speak to either changes the subject or agrees with me. People don't use CDISC, even when they're mandated to use it. What happens is that they do their thing, and then someone else translates it into CDISC, at the very last step. Um, and I, I am more ambitious than that. I want people to do it properly from the start, not to do it and then create a mapping because the mapping will degrade the quality of the data. So this is a small fragment. So Exad Magan is administrator of subcutaneous study agents. And you have, you have to work with those phrases and with those codes. Um, I'm not going to say anything about rich. So, the strategy. This is the yeah, final slide. It's what we are doing, in fact. We are identifying useful standards and building them. So, uh, sorry. Let me start. We are identifying useful standards. What we want to do is to find a clinical trial management system vendor who will help us to build those standards into that system so that we can test them. Do they bring any benefit? Do they work with the system? We're going to do something similar with laboratory information management systems. So we have already a vendor there who has tentatively agreed to talk to us about this experiment. Um, we're going to be working with the trialists both with clinical trial data management systems and with, with laboratory management systems and, and just doing their work as they do it in order to explore opportunities for building ontologies into what they're doing. Then on the other hand, the second part of the strategy is to work with Ravi Shankar in Stanford, who is part of an effort called FUSE, which is trying to incorporate ontology technology into CDIS. Now that is... a, a, a a very ambitious kind of project. FDA does not really interest itself 
enthusiastically in ontology, but there is a quite influential group of people who is working on experiments on this side of the house. And, uh, and we are here in Buffalo, so import in principle is interested in clinical trials about human immunology from all sources, both now and in the future. And we would be very keen on working with anyone in Buffalo who has immunology data and who wants to help get this process uh, moved forward. Thank you.